Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Amber Vanderberg, who is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. How are you doing, Amber? Doing well, doing well. Excellent, Hi. excellent. And uh, Amber is an international keynote speaker and founder of the Pathways Group, a multi award winning international business person, keynote speaker, and as I said, founder of the Pathways Group. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is competitive advantage within teams. And uh, okay, so Amber, let's. Uh, Let's let's get straight into it. Obviously, you know you you focus a lot with working with uh, companies and getting the most out of teams uh, and and how they work together. So, what is it? What are some of the competitive advantages you can uh, you can gain with teams? And what are the obvious ones? And what are the not so obvious ones? Uh, so, whenever we are working within teams, there are specific opportunities for ownership that we can define our. Uh, competitive advantage or opportunities to be uniquely better. We must first begin by clarifying our why, <laughs> starting with why, uh, and clarifying that vision. And then also clarifying the what as well. So what does success actually look like? What are we moving towards? And those two questions are going to lay the foundation for us to establish those opportunities to be uniquely better. So we're going to start with why, we're going to clarify the what. It's those opportunities for ownership in the how for us to really establish that competitive advantage within four major opportunities for ownership. So those four major opportunities are going to be within our processes, our methods, our projects, and our roles. I'll say that again, our processes, methods, projects, and our roles. Yeah. Um, so um, what's interesting about what you've outlined there is, I mean, a very systematic approach to to teams and you know let's face it i mean normally in a lot of places we just throw teams together i mean we have an objective or we have something a project something we've got to take on and we say okay this person this person then we throw them together and we pretty much just hope they're going to work well absolutely and very and if you're lucky it does um but um uh, we would like to leave things not always up to chance right there are some strategic action steps that we can take. Uh, and whenever we are looking to be strategic in building our competitive advantage, uh, this is a specific process that we can follow. So we may be recruiting the right, the right people, getting them on board. And sometimes you have the right people on board and they're operating under a system that is not setting them up for success. You need both, you need the right people and you need the right systems. Um, so give, give me a good example yeah. of what, what is, um, what is a system that works and what is a system when you don't have the right system, how you can tell. Fantastic. So the right system is first off a system that is going to be clear. So everybody understands it. Uh, it is not overly complex, right? Complexity can jade clarity. So it's going to be a very clear, straightforward system uh, that everyone can understand and operate under. It's a clear framework. Second, it's going to be just that, a framework. Uh, sometimes a system that we have may look very perfect, but there's not a lot of room for agility and adaptation. And so it's important that the system that we have acts as handrails and not handcuffs. Mm -hmm. So we really create that framework. So we're going to have clarity. And this is what the why and the what is, uh, but also here's our areas for flexibility. And this is where we can uh, really thrive in our performance. So a quality system is really going to have a balance between the two of clarity and adaptability. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, it's a very good point. I think that balance is a very good point because you can go too far one way or the other. You, know, you can have a system and maybe, you know, yeah. a project that's overly complicated, that's overly managed. Um, and then on the flip side, obviously, you can have one that's underly managed, to such a word, and uh, and a little a little chaotic. But that 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 combination, though, or that balance between having a good solid system, but yet enough flexibility to be able to deal with exceptions. Because I always feel like people people want to build 
processes to all the exceptions that's what messes up most things because they go oh yeah but what if what if this happens what if that happens instead of building it to the best case and then allowing the flexibility for those exceptions yes and a good litmus test that you can use within your team of it of our processes acting more as handrails or handcuffs is those opportunities for exceptions so how does your team respond whenever something outside of the norm happens? Uh, do they feel empowered to take, take a step to make those adaptations or does it have to go back through a whole line of processes, right? Do I have to ask my manager who asked their manager, who asked their manager, who asked their manager? And, and if, that's, if that's the system that you're operating under, your performance is not going to be as high. Um, a, a big reason being that the people who are operating under the system don't have the freedom to truly perform with confidence at their best level. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. And I think the the other part too, and this I think is complicating teams nowadays. Certainly, uh, I think a lot of a lot of the way work has evolved now is there's a lot of specialization right so when you put together a team for a, for a project or an initiative you're likely to have people who are very proficient at a particular thing and maybe you're the team leader or whatever you're not proficient at that and that is you have to be very good now at managing people who are very proficient at what they do but bringing them all together but also acknowledging the fact that you don't know everything Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that takes a level of humility moving forward as leader within the team. Yeah. So how do you make sure then that uh, that you you bring the right people together and you get them in the right seats and that and you give them enough autonomy to be successful, but not so much as to, you know, that you can lose track of things? OK, that was a couple questions. So I'm going to answer each one of them. Yeah, I, I just have this down to a fine hour where I ask three questions at one time, so then I can sit back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, so let, let me answer the first one uh, first. So you asked, how do we ensure that we get the right people on our team? There is an excellent book that I would recommend to everyone written by Pat Lencioni. Now, he is more well known for his book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. He has another book called The Ideal Team Player. And he outlines three major factors of the ideal team player. And that is someone that is humble, meaning that they are trainable, <laughs> that they are open to instruction and training. So someone that is humble, someone that is hungry. Now, hungry is not someone that's hungry in appetite, but someone that has drive, someone that uh, is not only trainable, but wants to be trained, wants to improve. Uh, and then the third is someone that is smart. So humble, hungry, and smart. And uh, now whenever Lencioni is writing about someone that is smart, he's not only talking about the ability to do the job, but also about the ability to be a team player. So you're looking at a high level of IQ in addition to a high level of EQ mm -hmm. uh, or emotional intelligence. So are they able to do the job, but they're a total jerk to everyone else in the team? probably not going to be that ideal team player. Um, and so whenever you're seeking the right person for the team, and this model has been applied in uh, in sports, in healthcare, in tech, it, it's a simple model that you can apply in many industries. Uh, looking at this humble, hungry, smart, really able to identify if someone will be successful uh, or be an ideal team player within the team. Uh, now, you want to seek someone that has all three factors. If you have someone that is humble and that is hungry but isn't smart, uh, people may really like the person, but they're not really going to get the job done. Or if someone is uh, hungry and smart but not humble, they're going to be very good at what they do, but not going to be open to conversation and instruction and training. So you really want to find someone that has all three layers. So uh, that is... A, again, a simple framework that you can work off of in the questions that you're asking in your interviews and how you're vetting your applications in, uh, in going through your behavioral interviews to find someone that meets that criteria, ask specific questions to define if someone is humble. So you can ask questions about, tell me about a time that you uh, 
failed. <laughs> Tell me about a time that you needed instruction. How did you handle that situation? Right. So you're going to ask specific questions about humble, hungry, and smart. Yeah. No, I think that's a great. I think that's a great framework because I know I think there's a there's a few other complications that are in the mix nowadays, and part of it is you may be building. With, with the way organizations ha have evolved, and especially since after the pandemic and all, you may be building a team that is made up of some employ full-time employees, maybe in the office with you, may not be, may be virtual. You may have some contract resources because you need a particular skill set for this project, but you don't need it all the time. Uh, and as I said, virtual work. So nowadays you have to maybe put together a team that once upon a time would you would have gone on, well, this is going to be really difficult because I've got some people that work for me, some people that don't, some people are remote, virtual, but that's just the way it is today. So you have to adapt to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it It is a bit more complex, but the more that we can clarify, this is what we're looking for, uh, the more you'll be able to um, allow your hiring managers to be in a position to know exactly what that framework is of how to find the right people for their team. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously, as you were saying, I mean, if you have humble, um, hungry and smart people in the right, you know, you can you could bring all of those together. But it becomes almost more important that they have these traits because of the fact is you may not be seeing them face to face. They may not even directly work for you. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and that's something within our company, within the Pathways Group, we are a multinational company. So uh, as we are hiring people remotely, uh, we are asking these questions as well. And uh, it's, it's critical in any environment. It is very critical in a remote environment that you have someone that meets these three factors. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, go ahead, John. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna ask, I. In, in that response, I forgot the second question that you asked me, if you could remind me. Yeah, I've, I've forgotten <laughs> too, to be honest. Um, but what I did want to ask you is then, what, what do you look for in team leaders um, today? Because just what we were talking about, like it's it's a much more complicated, maybe, um, you know, the setup and everything and the types of skills, the types of people, where they are, all of that. So what makes for a, re a good team leader nowadays? Mm. So... First off, it's important that your team define what is expected of your leader within your team. Uh, for different teams, there may be different expectations. And so that training process can be catered uh, to some degree, depending on what leadership is defined as within your organization. So that's the first thing that you need to do. Uh, sometimes people will come in wanting a leadership role, uh, and their idea of what those expectations are for that team, for that position is very different than what the team is expecting and what the organization is expecting. So again, first thing that you need to do is to clarify what is a leader within our team? Uh, what does that entail? Um, what does that entail in terms of the position? So that's gonna be the actual position, but also within the role uh, as well. Yeah. So. That so was more of a vague answer. No, 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 no. I think that's uh, good. I mean, I think uh, I would say to people, and when they say like, "Oh, yeah, I want to, I want to manage people, or I want to lead people," I'm always asking, "Well, why?" <laughs> you what, should go. What does that go, mean? Yeah. Yeah. What does it mean? Like, go check whether you really want to do it, because I think, unfortunately, we we live in a culture, or certainly a corporate culture, where it always seem, it always appears that in most comp, in most roles, uh, promotion is moving up a level and managing people and we have to get away from that because some people are fantastic at it and some people are fantastic at what they do but they suck at leading or managing other people and we need to find we need to find ways of allowing career paths that celebrate what you're good at rather than forcing you down a path that you may not be good at exactly and, and john i'll give you a quick example i used to um be a uh, be a football coach or a soccer coach mm -hmm. for a very large academy overseas that was operating under a framework that was command and obey. Uh, so you go to session, you learn how to kick the ball, you kick the ball, you wait for instruction. Um, and so it was very command and obey. And so we would have players come and say, Miss Amber, I want to be captain today. And my question was always, well, what is the role of a captain? And in a command and obey dynamic, the response was, 
a captain is the person who tells other people what to do. Like that was, <laughs> that was the response in with a lot of people. So that was the cookie cutter response I was getting. And so we actually took time to redefine the role of a captain, uh, which is essentially redefining that role of a leader uh, within that team. Now, if you have someone that's coming in uh, saying, okay, I want to be a leader and they are expecting to tell other people what to do, then then we may be setting people up for failure, right? Uh, once our, our players learned that a captain in our position is, or in our academy is being a servant leader, there were some players that said, nope, that's not what I want to do, <laughs> right? And so they were able to self-elect out. And then there were other people that said, actually, that is something that I'm more drawn towards. So uh, again, a quick example of what that yeah, looks no, like within I the think, team. I think, that's a, I think that's a great, great example because um, obviously if you take football or soccer, uh, that there are there are positions on the field where you want people to be kind of, sing, you know, they're part of a team, but you want them to be a little bit more singularly focused. Mm -hmm. uh, and then somebody who's a captain, you want them to obviously be inspiration, be able to lift the team. But if you're somebody who really needs to be singularly focused and that's your game and everything, you're going to make an awful captain. And it's great that people actually can recognize that. Exactly, exactly. And that's where you can go into what you spoke about, which is re-examining the word growth in terms of talent development that does not always have to be a promotion into a leadership role and companies are discovering that more and more of looking at continuous learning and development uh, looking at lateral movement so maybe going to a different department maybe going to a different location right so you're looking at different opportunities to grow in your skill to grow in your network um, and growth that's the key word is growth, not necessarily promotion. Um, and there are ways to monetarily reward that as well, right? It doesn't yep. always have to be a monetary lateral move, uh, but it is uh, providing value in terms of growth, in terms of professional growth, personal growth, um, relational growth within the organization. And the more that we re-examine that within the team, the more we'll be able to engage our team and put them in a position to provide more value to the overall organizational performance. Yeah, no, no, a hundred percent. Because I mean, I think we have to get to that point where we're looking at what people do well and we're trying to build on it instead of, we have this thing um, in, in, in corporate business about, you know, we will do like performance reviews with you and we'll go through and I'll go, yeah, listen, Amber, you did this really well this year, but let's focus now on the 52 things you did badly that I want you to improve on. And and that's kind of our approach instead of going, um, hey, Amber, these are the things that you're really, really good at. I need to find a way to get you, get more, get you doing more of that and less of these things over here that, you know, clearly either you're not good at or you don't want to be good at. Exactly, exactly. And even with that, we, if you're reimagining the performance review to where it's not a one-time conversation with 52 items, uh, instead you're having shorter iterations of conversation so you can focus on one thing at a time, uh, you'll be able to be more agile in your development. Yeah. And um, last question. Uh, so here's another one to throw throw a little um, span in the work. So today, uh, somebody told me recently, we may even be touching on at some stage five generations in the workforce, certainly four right now. It's the most that there's ever been or it will be the most that's ever been in the workforce at, at one time. So we have this huge uh gap but you know we have this huge uh, continuum of people like from the millennials and the z's all the way like boomers and all of that so you're working with a bigger cross-section of people than ever before generationally um so in some ways that's another great challenge isn't it for for teams is how do you as they as, as they love to talk about in 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 football professional soccer whatever like that you mix of youth and experience but getting getting the mixture and the balance right is even more critical and I'd say even can be a little more difficult than ever. Yeah. And that in that situation for generations specifically, we have to create a space for people to build understanding. And the best way to build understanding is not by saying, 
boomers act this way, Gen Z. It's not by categorizing uh, individuals. It's actually by creating platforms and opportunities for people to share stories. And so one thing that we'll do even within our team internally, and of course in training externally, is to ask questions. Hey, what was a defining moment in your childhood, right? What What's some music that you really love, right? So we're asking stories to build understanding. Now, these are open-ended questions that allow an opportunity for you to ask follow-up and gain that understanding. Um, and that's going to be much more meaningful than all Gen Z act this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think, uh, and I think we sometimes- I think because it's not necessarily the case. Create an opportunity for everyone to create understanding about the person, about the individual. Yeah, no, I think that's a great piece of advice because I do think some people are struggling with it. And then obviously, as we said, if you throw into the mix, you have uh, people uh, virtual, you have people from across the globe. So you have all the cultural. Uh, so it's quite a complex thing nowadays to put together a team and to make sure that you are setting it up in such a way that every every part of that team can can perform to its best. We acknowledge the differences, focus on the similarities. Right. So we're not going to hone in and just focus on all of our differences. No, we're going to acknowledge the differences. We're also going to focus on our similarities. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, listen, Amber, this has been fantastic. All of Amber's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell everybody a little bit more about you and your company. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So my name is Amber and I'm with the Pathways Group. So we are an international a corporate training and development company. So we focus mostly with multinational organizations in uh, training on cross-cultural collaboration, communication, team building, and leadership development. Fantastic. Well, listen, thanks again, Amber. Great, great insights. Thank you all for watching and listening. And I'll see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.